Welcome to the Expositors of Second Baptist Church of Houston, North Campus. The class hosts the teaching ministry of James Brooks. Our mission is to grow in the knowledge of Christ through the expositional teaching of God's Word. We do this by studying the Bible line upon line and verse by verse. We teach sound doctrine as we look at and live out God's unfolding plan of redemption for His church. Now let's join James in this week's study of God's Holy Word. So if uh, you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you will uh, turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we will complete the chapter this morning by looking at a message entitled, Paul's Appeal to a Wayward Church. Paul's Appeal to a Wayward Church. You'll recall that Paul established the church in Corinth, uh, and then he's writing back to them some five years later after he established the church, and he realized that they had not progressed far in their spiritual walk. Uh, he refers to them as... Uh, babes, he refers to them as those needing milk, and he spends the majority of this epistle uh, working on correcting the doctrine with which they believed and the actions that uh, followed as a lack of their um, living out the doctrine that he had taught them. And uh, Paul has been very harsh with the Corinthians up to this point. Uh, there's no mistaking that. He's had to correct them on all sorts of things. Uh, and so this is kind of a culmination before he begins dealing with specific sins uh, that we'll pick up with and, and look at next week as we begin chapter 5. Uh, but this morning I want us to look at through these verses, and we're going to look at verses 14 through 21. Uh, in verses 14 and 15 we'll look at Paul's purpose. In other words, why has he told him everything that he's told them up to this point? Well, he tells us that. Well, then in verses 16 and 18 look at Paul's petition. In verses 19 and 20, Paul's plan. And then in verse 21, Paul's proposal. Paul's proposal. So follow along with me as I read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Paul writes, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For... If you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. I exhort you, therefore, be imitators of me. For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ just as I teach everywhere in the church. Now some have become arrogant as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod? Or with love and a spirit of gentleness. So the first thing that we look at here in verses 14 and 15 as Paul is rounding off this chapter is that we finally see Paul's purpose. We see Paul's purpose for why he has uh, discussed and written these things to the Corinthian church. Much of it has to do with rebuke. In other words, things that they're doing wrong. For example... We notice that in chapter 3 and verses 5 through 7, uh, Paul is, is having to deal with uh, different factions in the church that were elevating uh, differing pastors and teachers. Some say I'm of Apollos, and some say I'm of Paul, and some say of Cephas, and some of Christ. And so Paul has to set them straight on that. It's not individual teachers through which you were blessed, but the Lord Jesus Christ, who in fact uh, is the one who causes the increase. These are merely means to an end. That is an end that God has ordained. And then in verse 18, we see that these individuals are pursuing false witness or wisdom. Uh, what it was is that they were... Uh, 
following after people, uh, perhaps in the church, who had great orative skills, people who were very good at theatrics when they spoke, people who could tell a story and, and, and just mesmerize the audience with their orative gifts and abilities. And Paul says if we try to preach some type of pseudo-wisdom through this means, that's not going to cut it. Because what saves people and what changes lives is the power of the gospel of Christ and that alone. And then in verse 21, Paul has to deal with their boasting. Boasting in these individual teachers. Boasting in the factions of which they were a part of. And then in verses uh, 1 and 5, 1 through 5 in chapter 4, uh, we see they're uh, making false assessments. And then also their false spirituality, claiming to be already have arrived at that place of uh, sanctification. And Paul says, I wish that truly were the case, uh, but that is not the case. We still got a long way to go. And so he had to correct them on their false assessments of who they were as the church. And so Paul then has left a stinging rebuke of the church. A stinging rebuke. But like any good parent, he tells them why he has corrected them. Those of us who were parents know that sometimes as our children were young and growing up, we had to correct them. Uh, we had to sometimes speak to them and they would do what we would say. Sometimes we would have to yell at them in order for them to do what we would say. And sometimes for those of us who were thick headed uh, back in the olden days, they uh, had these things called switches. And that was an attention getter. Uh, and there were ways and means in which parents could influence their children in order to get them on the right path. And so there was a sense of correction, but there, that was done on the basis of love. That was done on the basis of love. Paul even says, I do not write these things to shame you. In other words, to, to cause you to lose heart. To cause a wall of separation between you and I, Paul says. But to admonish, that is to change your thinking as my beloved children. MacArthur notes, he was their spiritual father, that is Paul, and therefore doubly responsible for their spiritual welfare. Now he tells them why he has been so harsh. He loves them as a father loves his children. He could not bear for them to be straying from God's word. And every parent, Christian parent in here, has that same type of sense and responsibility and also to some extent a sense of dread when they see their children out in the world uh, and they know the things that they're facing and they don't want to see them make the wrong decisions or sinful decisions. Now the thing that we need to keep in mind for this is that failure to engage, failure to correct, failure to teach, or failure to forgive your children can have tragic consequences not only in the spiritual life, but also in the experiential life. That is, how we relate to our own family members. It's such a big problem, for example, that Paul writes in Ephesians 6, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Do you realize that there's a sense in which your anger as a parent can be so burdening to a child that they can, it can emotionally scar them so that as they become adults, there'll always be some barrier between that parent and child because they have <coughs> provoked them to wrath. Provoked them to wrath. We see this, for example, in 2 Samuel. Everyone likes to think that David was a man after God's own heart, and he was. But that doesn't mean that David was a perfect man. David was a great king. But David had a lot of sin issues in his life, specifically as it relates to interpersonal relationships with uh, women and also with his own children. For example, there's one story in the Old Testament, and we won't go through it all because of the sake of time, but it's the story of Absalom. The minute that you hear Absalom, I know that those of you who grew up in the church think immediately about his long hair because the Bible talks about his long hair. That was actually the means of his death. His hair got caught up in a tree branch. Well, uh, Absalom wasn't David's only child. He had other children. Uh, Absalom had a half-brother, Amnon, and he, Amnon, his half-brother, raped his sister. It's very interesting how uh, Amnon 
proposes and pulls off this, this sexual sin and crime, uh, you can read about it in 2 Samuel beginning in verse or chapter 13. Uh, but what happens is that Amnon lusted after his half-sister. Scripture tells us that she was very, very beautiful and that he had his way with her. And immediately after he was able to have intercourse with her, Scripture tells us that he immediately began to hate her. And it says specifically that he hated her with a hatred that was greater than the lust for which he loved after her or lusted after her. And yet David, when he found out, did nothing in action on the part of the father. Even when he knew there was a sin that had been conducted by his own children. When Absalom, to avenge his sister, killed Amnon, David heard of it. And did nothing. When Absalom fled, David did not seek reconciliation. He did nothing. When Absalom returned, after several years, David began to really misapprehend his anger about his sin of killing his, his brother, David's son. Somewhat uh, was, David was at peace about that. When Absalom eventually did return to Jerusalem, David said, he can come back to Jerusalem, but I don't want to see him. Again, this is a father and son relationship. I mean, if you're Absalom, apart from the sin issue, when you think about that the father is breaking the relationship, the father is saying to the child, you can come up to this far, but no farther. I mean, building barriers with your children. That's what David was doing. When Absalom rebelled against David, and ultimately Absalom had the gift of gab because he began to turn people in the kingdom against David, so much so that he eventually tried to come in and proclaim himself king. The rebellion was thwarted. David, even in the midst of this rebellion, tells his generals, okay, you can run them out of town, but don't hurt them. Well, that plan didn't work out too well. David's men killed Absalom after he, his hair got caught in a tree as he was trying to run away. And he was run through with a spear. When David found out, he wept. In all of this sin, there is inactivity on the part of David. The only thing that he was able to do to respond to this, or that he eventually did do, and somewhat forced into this by the news of the death of his son, was that he wept wept at the loss of his child. There's a lot of things that uh, could be learned from this. We see this over in the book of Proverbs. Just basic parenting skills. Again, this is, we're talking about uh, uh, physical fatherhood here, but there's a lot much of this that can be applied in the spiritual realm as well. He who spares the rod hates his son. Why does he say that? What does that mean? It means don't provide any structure or di discipline for your children. The Bible is saying if you don't discipline your child, you hate your son. But he who loves him, that is, he who loves his child is careful to discipline him. Proverbs 22, 15. Folly is bound up in the heart of the child. That is foolishness. The capacity to make foolish decisions. Those of you who are parents, did you know your children are prone to make foolish decisions? <laughs> sure, you knew that. <laughs> Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline or the rod of correction will drive it from him. Now, many of you might be saying, well, I see those two verses talking about a rod. Are, are we so, so rash as to say that the Bible endorses corporal punishment? Well... Do not, dis, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with a rod, he will not die. There's the answer. So for all of the liberal left-wing people out there that say you shouldn't spank little Johnny, you'll scar him for life. Scripture, that is God says, if you withhold discipline from a child, if you punish him with a rod, he ain't going to die. That is, if you take a switch to his backside, you're not going to kill him. Punish him with a rod and save his soul from death. 
Save his soul from death. The rod of correction imparts wisdom. Basically, if you put your hand on a hot stove, you realize, hey, if I put my hand on a hot stove, I get burned. Therefore, I'm not going to put my hand on a hot stove. The rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a child left to himself disgraces his mother. And I would say disgraces his father as well. I can't tell you how many times working in the criminal justice system, we've had to take juveniles down and older juveniles also. And, and the parents are like, you know, they're so heartbroken. It just breaks their heart whenever they see it. And it's true. But if you had to go back and look at the source, there are a lot of poor decisions being made by those parents. Is why little Johnny's having to get in our back seat so that we can take him to jail. People who do not, parents who do not correct and discipline and instruct their children in the things of God will find suffering and disgrace in the future. Discipline your son, Proverbs says, and he will give you peace. He will bring delight to your soul. What we have to do, beloved, is remain consistent in the way that we treat and discipline and train our children. Chuck Swindoll, the great uh, Dallas Theological Seminary uh, President, now Chancellor, says, quote, Consistency and discipline helps our children learn to live under authority. First as children and later as adults. Our consistency and discipline helps model for our children how to be consistent in their own lives. Be consistent as parents. Let your children know exactly what you expect of them and how they are to do whatever it is that they need to do. And this was basically Paul's attitude toward the Corinthian church. Paul had birthed them, that is, Paul was the means through which the gospel came to them. Many of them came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Paul considers them his spiritual children. He cares for them. And so what he's doing is he is engaging in discipline with them. Paul was their spiritual father. Again, he was the instrument that God used to save many of the church. Paul uses this term spiritual father as affection, uh, as affectionately as possible, but it's not the only place where he uses it. He uses it elsewhere, for example, with Timothy. Young Timothy was a protege of Paul. Paul considered him his child in the faith, 1 Timothy 1-2. Also Titus, another young man who was uh, uh, an accompaniment uh, in Paul's company, Paul says in his epistle to Titus, my true child in a common faith. Grace and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Savior. And there's also another person that Paul specifically addressed as his child in the faith. And we find this over in the book of Philemon. The young man's name is Onesimus. Onesimus was a runaway slave as Paul was imprisoned in Rome. He leaves Philemon. He makes his way to Rome. He eventually contacts Paul. Or you'll recall from our uh, past studies that Paul was in, under house arrest. So people could come and go as they pleased to see Paul. But Paul was chained to a member of the Praetorian Guard under house arrest. And it was here that Onesimus comes to faith in the Lord Jesus through Paul's ministry. As such, Paul begins to say and identify Onesimus as his child. In Philemon 1 for example, Paul says, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, as he's writing back to Philemon, who is the owner of Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, Paul says. <clears throat> also, Paul knew that they're gaining, uh, that gaining children or converts involved in his participating in the evangelism process. Every Christian should do the same. What I mean by that is, is that Paul was a spiritual father. You can't be a father without children, right? If you're a person and you don't have, a, whether it be a woman or, or be a man, uh, you can't be a father or mother unless you have children. It's true because it's true by definition. And Paul understood that not just he, but all of us need to be about the task of engaging in birthing others for the kingdom. MacArthur states, a Christian is one who has been given new life in Christ. And one of the most important characteristics of life is reproduction. 
Yet many believers have never produced believers. In a sense, they are contradictions to what a Christian is. Every believer should be a spiritual father, God's instrument for bringing new lives into his kingdom. That begins the discipling process. Each of us are to be engaged in the process of discipleship. I don't care if you've been a Christian for 10 minutes, for 10 years, or for 100 years. There are people within your sphere of influence who can learn from you. Just like you're learning from other people, other people can learn from you. We all need to be about that task of making disciples, making followers. That's Paul's purpose. His purpose then, again, was not to shame them, but to instruct them as his father or their father in the faith. Now in verses 16 through 18, we see Paul's petition. He says, follow my example. Look at verse 16. I exhort you, therefore, be imitators of me. We've seen this in other epistles that Paul has written. The term to imitate comes from the word uh, mimetes, which is to mimic, to, to mimic after, to, to be like. Well, what was, what was Paul's example? What did he do for them? How were they to, to mimic or mirror his, his actions, his, his theology, his, his manner of speech, the way he conducted ministry? How were they to do that? Well, first and foremost, look at Paul's example. He was available. He was available. To be a good spiritual leader, you have to be available to those whom you lead. If not, you'll be the only person in the room. The implication of this for our contemporary times, and sometimes it hurts me, I, some of you know this already, but I have a real hard time with what I refer to as flat screen pastors. In other words, people who get together and they turn on a big screen TV and the guy who's preaching to them might be thousands of miles away. That person is not a spiritual leader. You're watching that person on the screen, but you cannot see their lives. You cannot see how that person interacts with his wife. You can't see how that person interacts with his family. You, that person cannot be a leader or an example to you because they're physically not here. Pastors, teachers, spiritual leaders have to be available to their congregations. You need to be able to look at my life. You need to be able to look at the way I treat my wife. You need to be able to look, look at the way I treat my children. You need to look and see how, how does my wife behave? How do my children behave? <laughs> that was my wife, by the way. She just said amen. <laughs> but Paul was available to the congregation. Paul was an example to the congregation. That's why he could say, mimic me, follow me. Now, before we think Paul is acting very boldly here, he will go on to say, for example, over in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, follow me as I follow Christ. Conversely, in areas where I don't follow Christ, don't follow me. That's the implication of what he's saying. But Paul secondly modeled the Christian ethic. Philippians 3, verse 17, he says, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk According to the pattern you have in us. That's what he's saying. To walk. Again, that's a figure of speech. Uh, that means how I conduct myself. How I arrange my life. How my spiritual walk is lived out before you. Observe those who walk. How do they walk, Paul? Well, he says, according to the pattern you have in us. How does Paul think? What does Paul say? How does Paul live? That's what he's talking about. And then thirdly and most importantly, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. We have to be careful, beloved, that whenever we talk to people, whether it be our friends, our neighbors, what have you, that everything that we say is reflective of a Christian worldview. A Christian worldview. If I got up here on Sunday mornings and I basically said, this is the world according to James Brooks, I wouldn't have very much to say. Moreover, I know you probably wouldn't want to just sit in here and listen to my own specific general opinions. Why? Because I'm no authority. 
Why would you listen to anything that I have to say on my own authority? You wouldn't. What we have to do, beloved, and Paul understood this, Paul didn't sit down and discuss or philosophize with people the worldviews of this world. Everything that he did, if he did discuss other worldviews, was always given in comparison and contrast to a ultimate source of authority, namely the Word of God. And Paul reasoned with people on the basis of the Word. For example, in Acts 28, Luke writes, When they had set a day for Paul, they came to see him at his lodging in large numbers. And he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus. Now, how was he trying to do that? Was he saying, you know, uh, we need to sit down and, and you need to, to go watch uh, a certain television show where you can pick up some good rule instructions on how, how you can you know, have 12 steps to, to having a more successful life or five steps to having good kids or three steps to have a better lawn or what have you. No. Paul reasoned with them on the basis of the Scriptures. Luke even says, Paul tried to persuade them. How? By using the law of Moses and from the prophets. Now that's a fancy way to say the Old Testament. The law and the prophets. From morning till evening, Paul discussed these things with them. But that's not the only example. In Acts 17, 2, for example, as was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service and for three Sabbaths in a row. So for three weeks in a row, he used the Bible to reason with the people. Now, Paul was an intelligent man. There's no question of that. But Paul didn't pontificate on his own beliefs. Rather, he reasoned with people on the basis of a Christian theistic worldview. That is a huge problem. I know many of you are saying, okay, we get that. That's, that's, that's very simplistic. Really? If I were to go over there and, and sit down and pull ten random people out, they're all going to give me different answers. Uh, most of them are going to give me different answers if I were to give them ethical type questions. Why? Because we don't think alike as a Christian society. And that's not just with this church, that's with any church. How do I know that that's the case? Look at our society, folks. We have people theologically and biblically that don't know their right hand from their left hand. The problem starts in the pulpit and is exacerbated in the pews. Because people are going home and teaching their family and interacting with their neighbors. And they're giving worldviews, but they're giving anything other than a Christian theistic <coughs> worldview. As such, Paul understood that this was a huge problem in the Corinthian church. Paul wasn't able to come just yet, so what he was going to do is send them the next best thing, namely, his protege, Timothy. Look at verse 17. For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. Now what is Timothy going to do? Paul tells us that. And he will remind you of my ways. And what is his ways? How Paul thought, how Paul talked, how Paul lived. Which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in the church. Paul set a great store by this young man, Timothy. Timothy would eventually become the pastor over in Ephesus as Paul writes to him from his uh, prison epistles as Paul was in Rome. This is under his second arrest. He writes first and second Timothy back to Timothy to encourage him. But consider the great importance that Paul places upon the relationship that he has with his young protege. He says, what you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Jesus Christ. Again, 2 Timothy 2, Paul says, and the things you have heard me say, and the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. And then again in 2 Timothy 3, but as for you, that is you, Timothy, Continue in what you have learned and what you have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So Timothy was a young man who mirrored Paul. 
Uh, I always wondered about that type of relationship until uh, I was, in 1997, met uh, one of the professors over at the College of Biblical Studies, Dr. Harry Leaf. Um, the first class I ever had with him, uh, I was amazed that, that this guy was like a walking encyclopedia of biblical knowledge. And, and I would try to tax him, not in class, of course, but afterwards I would sit down and talk with him. And, uh, you know, I could answer a, or ask him a question pretty much about anything. And everything that he would do, he would immediately tie back to the scriptures and then explain the answer. i would never been in the presence of another human being who had that ability. I knew there was something different about him. The, the professors there were all great, but he was special. And so I set myself to be his pupil. So I took all of my theology classes from him. I took all of my Bible courses from him. I eventually went to his church as a learner and eventually served with him as his associate pastor. It got to the point where I'm sure it is with many of you, where those of you who have been with me for a while, as we begin to go through the scriptures, uh, you know, I, I could tell you if he was going to start a sentence, I could complete the sentence for him. If he was going to direct us to the text to illustrate some portion of the text theologically, I knew where he was going and what he was going to say and how he was going to bring it on home, as they say, before he even did it. Why? Because I knew his worldview. I knew how he would think. Everything that he thought, everything that he said, everything was tied back to the Scriptures. And that's the way that we need to be. Scripture tells us that Everyone, as they are trained by a, a teacher, when they grow up, if you will, will be just like that teacher. That's the way Timothy was with Paul. Paul could start a, for a sentence and Timothy could finish it. And that's why Paul wanted to send Timothy there because they knew that if Paul couldn't be there, Timothy was going to be the next best thing to having sound, biblical, godly instruction. However, not everyone, Paul said, would be convinced of this. There were still going to be naysayers in the crowd. Look at verse 18. <clears throat> now, some have become arrogant, puffed up, as though I were not coming to you. What he's talking about here are those party leaders in the church. You know, those who said, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. The leadership, the ringleaders, if you will. They were, they were, having, they were going to give Paul a hard time to the very end. Again, MacArthur notes, thinking they would probably never see Paul again, they thought they could get by with doing as they pleased. They may have been so arrogant as to think Paul would not dare to confront them. The church had a serious problem with pride and self-will, and when strong spiritual leadership was not in place, many believers easily slipped back into their old ways of thinking and behaving. And that's what leads us to the next section of Paul's letter, his plan, his plan. Look at verse 19. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. Paul, always the theological doctor, says it this way. My plan is to come to you. And he really wants to come, but he understands that he operates on the prerogative of the divine will. All of us. And, and this should bring us comfort to some extent. Knowing that what happens is by God's eternal decree or counsel. The term that Paul uses there, if God desires. In other words, if it's God's plan that I come to you, I will come to you. And Paul is saying that if I come to you, I'm going to come in a spirit of correction and confrontation. Paul then tells them, you think that you have power because you have words. You esteem those who have the gift of oration as if somehow they have some type of power to encourage you, power to make you grow. That's not true. And Paul says, And I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. Paul wants to know, let's look at your life and see if that measures up. Sure, anybody can say anything. Don't tell me how you're living. Show me how you're living. 
MacArthur again notes, this is a central principle of great importance. Faith that does not result in right living may have many words to support it, but it will have no power. A person's true spiritual character is not determined by the impressiveness of his words, but by the power of his life. Again, Paul is going to examine their ethics, how they're living, and then destroy the worldview that supports what they're saying. Now that may sound somewhat harsh. You mean Paul is really going to try to destroy the worldview? Certainly. What Paul is saying is that he's looking forward to having an, an apologetic encounter with these teachers. He tells us that over in the book of 2 Corinthians. When he says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. That is, in the, in the spiritual battle, we're not looking for spears. We're not looking for nine millimeters. We're not looking for swords. Rather, the weapons that we yield are immaterial. They are our words, specifically the words of Scripture. And they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Now, notice what he says. For we are destroying speculations. The word speculation there comes from a Greek word that means any non-biblical worldview. Any lofty idea. Any grand philosophy. Anything that is contrary to a biblical life and worldview, Paul is saying we are destroying those things and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive. Now he uses a military term here that means to be taken captive in the sense of being a prisoner of war. We know about prisoners of war, particularly back in the 80s. There were movies about prisoners of war. Uh, and we know that, for example, from the conflict that we had, that America had with Vietnam, where many of uh, POWs had to stick around for a few years, and some of them never came back. And then there were the movies about the POWs. I think Chuck Norris made a movie, uh, Missing in Action, back in the 80s. Uh, uh, Rambo, uh, John Rambo in the 80s, you know, uh, where they had to go in and rescue POWs. Men who had been taken captive by the enemy in their thinking. But Paul is using that in the opposite term here. And what he's saying is, no, if something's being taken prisoner, what we are going to take prisoner is the fleshly worldview philosophies that this world has that stands in direct opposition to what God has said through His Word. Those ideas are being taken captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. That is the Christian's goal. And the battlefield, therefore, is in the mind. The battlefield is in the mind. The product of their lives, the lives of these people, indicates the true power of the kingdom. A worldview that does not produce Christian growth is a sorry worldview and one that needs to be rejected. So we've seen then, therefore, Paul's purpose, Paul's petition, Paul's plan. Now in closing, let's look at Paul's proposal, verse 21. He says, what do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Paul is saying, and the right hand is the rod. And by here, he doesn't mean that he's physically going to come back and beat the Corinthians. But it does mean that he's going to come back and they're going to be subject to face discipline. Well, what kind of discipline? We talked about this a few weeks ago. But he's talking about church discipline. We see the precedent for this over in Matthew 18. For the sake of time, we won't look at it again today. But that could lead to excommunication. That is, being removed from the church. You know, a lot of times, particularly in churches today, and I've really had to struggle with this issue in this study, people who engage in active sin and rebellion, even against the face of having one or two people come uh, to them, 
and engage them in a loving way to try to correct their attitudes and behaviors and they say, you know what, I hear what you're saying, I'm not going to do that, a lot of churches will say, okay, well, uh, you know, we're going to pull your membership card, but you're still free to come to the church. <clears throat> That's going to be in conflict with what Paul's going to tell us next week. When we look at what church discipline is for the sinning rebellion, when Paul says, "Touch, touch turn such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Have nothing to do with such a one, Paul says. If that's the case, how does that comport with, well, let's just allow them to come in and pull their membership card. We'll look at that next week. But excommunication is a viable alternative in the process of church discipline. And then finally, there's physical death. I'm not saying that the church is to kill the sinning believer. That's not what I'm saying. That is, uh, uh, 1 John chapter 5, uh, John says that there is a sin that leads to death. And we don't know what that sin is. Whatever it is, it's something that's probably a very public type of sin and one that brings great reproach upon the name of Christ. That God it is within His divine prerogative to keep that believer from shaming himself, shaming the church, shaming Christ. And so God will say, you know what, just come on home. And He'll use physical death as a means to accomplish that end. So they could face church discipline. That's one alternative. Secondly, they could face a gentle, kind, spirited Paul. Paul could come back and say, you know, Timothy has reported that you guys have repented. You guys are growing up in the faith. You're attending Bible study. You're an active witness for Christ. The, the relationships in your homes are doing great. Praise the Lord. You know, let's move on. That was also an option for the Corinthians. But they are at a pivot point between the right hand of the rod of discipline and the left hand of compassion and kindness. William Barclay in his commentary on this verse says, The love of Paul for his children in Christ throbs through every letter he wrote. But that love was no blind sentimental love. It was a love which knew that sometimes discipline was necessary and was prepared to exercise it. There is a love which can ruin a man by shutting its eyes to its faults, to his faults. And there is a love which can mend a man because it sees him with the clarity of the eyes of Christ. Paul's love was the love which knows that sometimes it has to hurt in order to mend. Well, what can we take away? from Paul's admonition. Again, this was written 2,000 years ago. If there were things that we could draw principally from this text that would be applicable to us, what would it be? Well, consider this. First, be active in sharing your Christian faith. Paul has talked a lot about what it means to be a spiritual father. Each of us need to be engaged in the process of discipleship with our friends and neighbors and in the process of evangelism. You cannot be a spiritual father without spiritual offspring. And God expects that we all have spiritual offspring. Secondly, be faithful in setting a Christian example to those within your sphere of influence. Know your power. It's in the Word. Simply saying this, when you are confronted with your neighbors, when you are confronted with the people at work who are struggling with some type of moral or ethical issues, let them see Christ in you as the example. So that if they come to you and ask you for advice, be very, very careful that you don't say, I think, but that you run and look at that opportunity as, this is a pop quiz from God. He's given this to see, how am I going to handle the situation? Rather than you should say, well, you know, the Bible says, and then give the answer. That's an answer that honors God and, will, and give grace to those who are asking the question. And then finally, be tactful in your engagements with others regarding matters of sin and the issues of life. From time to time, you will be confronted with those who will bring before you sin issues. Remember, church discipline is always about repentance and restoration. Christians have a notorious reputation for shooting our walking wounded. 
We're very, very quick to say, to condemn a brother or sister in Christ who's sinning. But how many times will we go to them and offer godly counsel with them? To put our arms around them and encourage them. Rather than just beat them over the head with the scripture. Be an encouragement. Be a witness. And trust that through that encounter, God will bring reconciliation and repentance. Well, let's pray.